Hello, how are you all? Um, it is fantastic to be here yet again, and thank you to Shona for that lovely introduction. And it is, it's great to, to, to meet John Calder after 20 projects, as Shona mentioned, and 40 years. It's, it's been quite a, a long and epic journey for you, I imagine. So congratulations on your 40th. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, does it actually feel like that long since you first invited Jean-Claude and, of course, Christo to come along and wrap our coastline? Well, it does, actually, <laughs> yes. It's, uh, I don't normally look back. I like to look forward. So this exhibition is making me look back and bringing back lots of memories. Um, but I'm not very good at timelines. Well, that's what we're here for, to go through the timeline. So when you invited Christo to come to Australia, you were actually 30 years old, or 31, I think. Is that right, yes. when that happened? So, so how did you even find out about him? What's that story? Well, I'll try and do it abridged because we only got <laughs> half an hour. Um, the company I was working for um, was doing sculpture, was doing a sculpture prize for young Australian sculptors. And we did three of these prizes, two here at the Art Gallery and one in Melbourne. And I thought, for a change, it'd be good to do something with an international artist. And I saw reproductions of Christo in an art magazine. And I was traveling quite frequently on business to the States and to Europe. And um, I went into a gallery and asked, do you represent Christo? And they said, no, but uh, we know him well. And if you want to call him, here is his phone number. So I called him from the nearest phone booth. In those days, there were no mobiles. And um, I actually spoke to his wife, Jean-Claude, who is very much a partner in their endeavor. And she was a bit hesitant and said, well, we've got about half an hour tomorrow. Come up to our studio, um, which I did. And we hit it off really well. And I stayed about four hours. And um, I invited them to come and have an exhibition and do a lecture. And they said, no, we don't want to do exhibition. We don't want to lecture. We really want to wrap a coastline. Well, <laughs> of course, you get asked every day to find a coastline to wrap. But that was the first time I was asked. And um, they were and are so charismatic that they convinced me that the most important thing I could do is find them a coastline to wrap. So I came back to Australia, and I went around systematically um, all the foreshores of Sydney. And the foreshores of Sydney in those days was army, navy, and government. And in those days, I didn't have a beard. Instead, I had long hair. My Hungarian accent was very much like it is today. And I walked into these offices called, and I said, I'd like to borrow a piece of coastline. And they said, well, what do you want to do with it? And I said, well, we want to erect a temporary sculpture. What kind of sculpture? Well, actually, we want to wrap it. <laughs> well, I was laughed at or thrown out, but wasn't treated seriously. But I persevered, and I ended up at Prince, Hos uh, Prince Henry Hospital which in those days was an isolationist hospital for tropical diseases. And um, the administrator there said, look, it's absolutely crazy, but if you cover the insurance, if we can charge an admission which will go to the hospital, the nurses, patients, and doctors might be amused by it. <laughs> so that's how it happened. That was the start. So Christo tells you, uh, I would like to wrap a coastline. You go to knocking on doors to find that coastline. Uh, and then, of course, you've got to make that, that project happen. How daunting was it? It's, it's no small feat, really, is it? Looking back, it's absolutely frightening. At that time, we didn't have time to be scared. Uh, we had to find the material. We had to find people to help way to do it, because now Christo and Jean-Claude, they do these enormous projects, like the last one in Central Park, the Gates, 
And they have a whole very professional team of engineers, environmental study people. We learned as we went along. We used a lot of students from, especially from the University of Sydney. The architecture department was most helpful and one of the stars of the architecture department, Iman Stillers, who won the gold medal for architecture, actually, after helping Christo, decided he doesn't want to be an architect, he became an artist. And a lot of people were influenced by Christo, but it was really trial and error. Mm. And um, the gods of art looked down on us as we succeeded without too much too much serious problems. And hands on for you, I imagine, in the shorts out there on the coastline yourself, wrapping the coastline for you? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Was that fun, a bit scary? Oh, it depended on the day. Some days it was fun. When we had a gale force wind blowing, <laughs> it was very daunting. Such a large scale public artwork had never actually seen, been seen before in Australia prior to this. Is that right? Nothing on, on that particular scale. So, so what was doing something like that in the first place for you? What was your actual motivation to start something like that? Because it wasn't for you personally, was it? No, not at all. Um, well, to answer your first question, um, Tony Bond, who is the associate director here in charge of international art, he researched it now when he did an introduction to the book and actually found it wasn't only the largest contemporary artwork in Australia, it was the largest in the world. Now obviously we didn't set out to do the largest contemporary artwork in the world, uh, it just happened. Um, second question, why did I do it? In the 60s, I started to travel a lot on business. And it was then that really pop art exploded internationally. People like Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg, Andy Warhol, Liechtenstein, Robert Indiana, Rosenquist. It was the whole New York school, really. And I started to collect Australian art. Uh, I had a small salary, but I was collecting and I met my contemporaries, people like John Olson or Fred Williams, and their works for small watercolors or small drawings, oils, were a few hundred, was it dollars or pounds? I'm not sure, a few hundred pounds, I think. Well, in New York, an Andy Warhol or a Roy Lichtenstein in those days was cheaper than a John Olson. And in many ways, to me, much more exciting. So I started to collect international art. And after a few years, I thought I'd like to share my love of art with the Australian public because in some ways I think collecting is a very selfish endeavor. Your family sees it, your friends see it, but the public certainly not. And I wanted to share with the public the latest developments of contemporary art. I mean, in those days, Australia was so isolated, contemporary art, we really didn't know, or if we did, it was very much second or third hand what was going on. So that was really my motivation. And you've always had a passion for art, even prior to that. You, you were exposed to it from a very young age, weren't you? Tell, tell us a bit about your, your background in, in discovering art. OK. You, you people are prepared to be here all night. <laughs> um, it happened when we escaped from Hungary. We were stateless. That was 1948. We eventually got to Paris, and Paris at that time hundreds of thousands of refugees from Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Poland, all the Iron Curtain countries. And we applied to several countries for papers to emigrate. Uh, a lot of the Hungarians went to Latin America, so we applied to Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and we waited. 
And my parents wanted me to go to a French school because we didn't know how long we would stay. I was 12. So they enrolled me. And because I couldn't speak French, they put me with 12 years old. Uh, sorry, with six years old. And I was a very sophisticated 12 years old, having lived through Second World War and escaping. And I thought that's really beneath my dignity to be with six years old kids, little snooty brats. So, <laughs> no. And I told my parents that I'm not going to do this. So my mother made a deal with me. She said, I'll take you to all the monuments, all the museums in Paris, because in those days, travel wasn't what it is today. We had no money, and we didn't know if we ever come back to Europe. So my mother took me to the Louvre, to the uh, Rodin Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and I thought, this is great, so much better than going to school. So that's <laughs> how I got interested in, in art. And it stayed with you ever since, which is fantastic. Um, tell me a bit about the, the, the project that was quite soon after that, which of course was Gilbert and George. And for me, I, I've got to say, going downstairs and having a look at something I'd read about, but I'd never actually seen them singing that song endlessly, incessantly. Why did you bring out Gilbert and George? What did you like about them? They represented, again, something very different, something very new in, in contemporary art. And they were very keen to show their art to the world. And um, I thought it would be a great project, very different to what Christo and Jean-Claude did. So in a way, it was logical. And what exactly did they do? And, and I suppose part of it is how were they received at the time? Apparently, it was, it was quite an extraordinary response, wasn't it? It was actually fantastic when I listened to Underneath the Arches, the song that you can hear when you're there, still sends shivers down my spine. <laughs> uh, they came to Sydney and to Melbourne, here at, the National, here at the gallery and at the National Gallery of Victoria. They stood on a table for five hours and to the tune of Underneath the Arches, just moved around. One had a walking stick and the other had a rubber glove and they were absolutely hypnotic. I had several artist friends who said, oh, what they're going to do isn't art. I'll just come for five minutes to reconfirm my belief. And after several hours, they were still sitting there. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were really hypnotic. Can you still sing the song in your head? Uh, you wouldn't want to listen to me <laughs> singing. But for you, I mean, even from Christo to Gilbert and George and beyond, it hasn't actually been, as, as you mentioned, with Christo's first project, it, you know, he wanted to come to Australia and do something. And that's been part of the, the message or the, the ideal or the philosophy behind these art projects ever since. Why, why is that so important to you about bringing artists to here to do something, as opposed to an exhibition or a lecture tour or something like that? That's a very good um, point, which I'd like to just... Can everybody hear me? Which I just like to emphasize, I don't want to compete with museums or galleries. We don't bring out exhibitions because that's really the role of a gallery. We want to bring out artists who will do a project here. Several reasons. First, the artist can see firsthand Australia, meet the art community, meet artists. And secondly, when they do a project in Australia, something of Australia sticks to them, whether it's uh, Little Bay, whether it's the most recent one, um, which was in Melbourne, the old Melbourne jail, uh, Gregor Schneider on Bondi Beach, Oz Fisher on Cockatoo Island. When these artists respond to a site, it becomes part of the work. The site becomes part of the work. For example, um, Richard Long, he did a project here in 1976, and he went for a walk, because that's what he does, in the outback. And that work was shown this year at Tate in Britain. Uh, Urs Fischer has currently a show in a museum in New York, and what he did in Australia is represented there. 
So we not only bring artists to Australia, we also take Australia and connect it to the international contemporary art world. Mm. But throughout this entire time, you've never actually been prescriptive, have you? When you've invited an artist to come to Australia, it's purely what they want to do, isn't it? They find the site, they tell you. That's been very important for you. Yes, absolutely. For sure. Well, we work with the artist to find a suitable site that they would like to respond to. Mm. Say, for example, with Richard Long, whom you just mentioned, and also even Gilbert and George and a number of the other artists. I mean, you were inviting them to do something in Australia in the 70s, very early in their career, and they're still going strong. Is they that, are. Yeah, is that a surprise to you that, you that they are still having that level of respect? Or were you just very cluey back in the 70s? Um, well, I'll answer that differently. <laughs> One of the things that I'm really proud of that the artists that we brought out, who were just at the beginning of the career, have all gone down in art history as really masters of contemporary art. I mean, if you go through the artists of the 70s or the Australian artists that we took to New York, Jeff Koons, they all have really put themselves in the, in the books of contemporary art. Mm, they've definitely left their stamp. In fact, it's also fantastic to go downstairs and have a look at the, the work of Nam June Paik and, and also uh, Charlotte Mormon. And tell me a bit about bringing them to Australia in, in 1976. What, what was the inspiration for, the, for those two great artists? And also, I mean, it's such a great story too, what they got up to while they were here, isn't it? Well, Nam June Paik, a Korean-born uh, actually trained as a classical musician, lived in Japan, Germany, and at the end in the United States, uh, turned to video art, and he's regarded as the granddaddy of video art. And Charlotte Mormon, who again was a classically trained and performing cellist, got interested in very contemporary music, and the two of them often teamed up to perform. And I thought it would be very important to bring out Nam June Pike and Charlotte to again show the Australian public the latest development of how art is taking a new direction. And today video art or moving image art is very much accepted. In those days, it was just the beginning. Mm, it was very new. And Charlotte was actually upstairs, wasn't she, on the roof of the art gallery doing something that would be... Hanging her cello off the roof and letting it play in the wind. <laughs> she also was suspended with about a dozen helium balloons above the opera house. I mean, a lot of the projects which we did, you just wouldn't be allowed to do. I mean, can you imagine somebody floating with balloons next to the opera house uh, <laughs> you'd have dozens of fire trucks and you know health and safety and just can't do that it must have been good to have that freedom though to be able to really experiment i imagine it would have well been. we just have to find other things now <laughs> exactly is it tough now in in terms of artists wanting to achieve something to you know literally reach for the skies like mormon did back then when you do have these sorts of limits that are set on us these days i suppose no, I don't think about it that way. I, uh, we still work very hard for the artist to do something that's really important. Mm. Well, one of the works which is in my memory, I must say, because I was in second year university, was outside the front of the Museum of Contemporary Art, and of course it was Puppy by Jeff Coons. Uh, and it was a really beautiful story. Tell me about bringing that out to Australia. The first Puppy was shown in Germany to coincide with one of the documenters. The documenter is in a little town called Kassel, um, and document is probably the most important contemporary art exhibition uh, in the world. It's every five years. And in a little town next to it, Jeff Koons erected this 12-meter-high puppy, but it was made out of wood and it didn't quite last uh, because the flowers had to be watered, there wasn't an irrigation system, and the puppy sort of rotted away. <laughs> uh, but I was intrigued. Bad puppy. 
I was intrigued by it, and I spoke to his dealer first in London, who said, John, don't touch it. It cost me a lot of money, and it just can't be done. And, he said, and I said, no, I'd still like to try. He said, well, talk to Jeff directly. Uh, you're a friend. I don't want you to get involved because you'll be sorry. <laughs> Jeff basically said the same. And I still wanted to persevere. And I got a little um, model of the puppy, which is downstairs in the exhibition, if you see it. And I was fortunate that we found a very good engineer, Doug Knox, who with computers dissected this wooden puppy horizontally and vertically in a couple of centimeter layers, and then blew it up to three stories. And we built it like a large uh, Meccano set that got screwed together on site with an internal staircase and with um, an irrigation system. and. It was very happy. <laughs> it was a very in, happy so, puppy, wasn't yes. it? It also was a bit crazy on top, I hear. For a, I actually heard a story about something that was growing on top that uh, made Jeff Coons very unhappy about his puppy. Tell me about the crazy plant. Well, a week after Jeff Coons went back, I was looking down at the puppy, and there was this plant growing up between his ears. <laughs> and I asked one of the attendants, what's this? And they said, John, you don't want to know. I said, well, come on, what is it? Well, actually, it's a marijuana plant. <laughs> and, well, my reaction was the same as yours. I thought it's quite funny. And when I was sp speaking to Jeff, I said, guess what? He got so upset. He said, the puppy is about innocence, it's about love, <laughs> it's about purity. No, he was extremely serious. And he said, you must remove it immediately. And I said, all right, well, I'll get it taken off if you feel that strong. You know, he rang me up on the hour, every hour. Has it gone yet? Has it gone? And I said, Jeff, it's three stories. I must get a cherry picker. I'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll get it removed. You know, he probably rang me up about a dozen times uh, before I could get it taken out. And it's a very good illustration how artist think. I mean, to him, the puppy really was a representation of love, of innocence, of purity. Did the puppy have a bald patch afterwards, though? No, 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 no. <laughs> the last couple but somebody of... had a good smoke. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, it was over 15 years ago, so we, yes. can, we can let that one go. Now, look, the last couple of years have actually been quite busy for you. Obviously, we've got the work that's outside the front doors, and there's been a number of really, really great Project. So the artists just simply better today. That's why there's more works. Or have we got more time? No, I got more time. I consider myself very fortunate. I retired from my profession in textiles about four or five years ago now, and I can devote my time to my passion, which is art. So, also since 2003, the government gave us cultural status. Um, which means we operate like a gallery or like any charitable organization. Um, we had to be more structured. We formed a board. I have a group of very good people who work with me. And we decided that we'll do two projects a year plus an education project. So I like to be busy. So how, how does that work for you? I mean, obviously, you know, in the past, it was your choice and your taste in some ways about who you wanted to bring to Australia, and now it's, it's is it a choice by committee, or are you still driving the, what well, you Well, we what consult, and mm. we also got an international advisory committee of top curators in England, in Italy, in America, who advise us. But, for example, say with something like Bill Viola, I had a lovely interview with you where you were talking about um, Bill Viola and, and, and music, in fact, and, and that was the work in 2008. What did you like about that work? Why did you want to bring him to Australia? I think Bill Viola is probably among the handful of really great moving image artists. He really took video art, if you want to call it that, to a completely different level. Um, I like his sensibilities. 
I saw part of that work in London and I thought to do it in a church would be a very moving experience because it's quite different to see it in a gallery to seeing it in a church and it looked just wonderful in a church. I mean, people sat there absolutely hushed. Uh, I went in there with a friend who insisted on me trying to explain it and I whispered and I was told of several times to be, please be quiet, <laughs> like in a church. It was quite a transformative experience then, evidently, for sure. Um, tell me a bit about the latest work, because it's, it's really striking. I mean, just even to, to walk inside and to be face to face with sculptures that I've looked at for so many years, but I must admit, not really noticed that closely. Well, exactly, and it's the transformation that's interesting. I mean, I'm sure all of you walked in and out of the gallery and you know, the sculptures haven't moved probably in a hundred years or more, but people don't notice it. Well, I think in this way, once the two cubby houses go, you won't be able to walk past them without looking at them. And I think that's one of the wonders of art, whether contemporary or going right back through the centuries to Greeks, to Romans, to Egyptians, I think art really makes you open your eyes, make you see things different. It alters reality. And I think once you're in there, you just have a different reality, a different take on reality. So how many times have you walked up into the, the sculptures just out there? Have no. you touched them, the bronze sculptures? Uh, I'm not sure if you're allowed to touch them, <laughs> but... Um, I, Oops, patted I, the, did. Oopsies. I patted the horse once, <laughs> uh, gave it a sugar and, you know, a good horse. Uh, I've been up a few times just to see the reaction of people. It's quite amazing, isn't it? And the fact that it's outside of the gallery and we're, we're in a public space, we're looking at something in such a different way, it really is. It's quite extraordinary, for sure. I also wanted, you know, when it was proposed to do this retrospective downstairs, which I hope you have seen. If not, please have a look. Um, I wanted to do a new project to show really our commitment to the future, that we're not about the past. We're very much about the future of bringing great art, great artists to Australia. Talking about that exhibition, though, and, and in fact this large tome next to me, I mean, going back through the archives and, of course, looking forward as well, what was it like for you to go back and to... I mean, some of those letters down there that talk about... You've got to go and read them, like, the, the information between, you know, John and Christo trying to describe what they're going to do is just... It's amazing. What's it like going back for you, reading all that again? Well, working on the book with Annalise, the designer, and Sophie, the editor, was a fantastic experience and it's really a wonderful history of a history of the projects because it really reveals what went into it and um, I mean just show it because it's really it tells the story of our 40 years and um, it's in the bookshop if you want to have a closer look um, it's Sophie and Annelies really did a wonderful job. Mm. They know more about the projects now than I do. Talking about the projects, though, in the last 40 years, has there ever been a project that an artist has suggested where you, of course, open to all ideas, just went, mm -mm, I don't think so, I have my limits, or not? Uh, there have been a number of projects that we couldn't do. Um, whether it was financial or permission or, or to abstract or, yeah, it's not that I didn't like them. It, it's more, we have to be realistic about doing a project and some of them were not really quite resolved. For sure. And one of the other things, though, of course, as you said, it's about looking forward as well so that there will be another 40 years to ce celebrate. And, and part of it is actually educating. And there's this, this, this program that you set up a couple of years ago that's all about getting video art into schools. T tell me a bit about that. Well, 
I believe that art education is very, very important, and we want to do more and more. We started off with a project for secondary schools where we asked leading Australian video artists to do a work for secondary schools, for high schools. And we first started to distribute them in New South Wales. Now we're in Victoria, South Australia, and next year we'll be in Queensland and Western Australia and hopefully the rest of the remaining states. There are about just under 2,000 high schools, public high schools in Australia, and so far we're in about 1,400 of them, which if you just work it out, we're probably close to two, touching two million young people, introducing them to art. And I keep saying that it's one thing to preach to the converted, but again, to open the eyes of young people to art is very satisfying. And with this video in the school, we can reach the furthest outback schools, whether it's in outback South Australia or New South Wales or Queensland, um, and they have direct access to original artwork. And we want to, we're working on a project for primary schools. And we want to do something for tertiary schools. I wish it was around when I was at school. That would have been great. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, John, maybe some questions for you. Is any, has anybody got any questions for John? There's a 40 years of art projects to talk about here. If you have any questions, the lovely Ashley will come around with a, a microphone. You just have to raise your hand. Just here. You made a comment about art opens your eyes and makes you see things differently. You made a comment, art opens your eyes and makes you see things differently. Yes. What feedback have you had, you know, in terms of what the material you put into the schools from either the teachers or the pupils? We had, we had a lot of feedback from uh, the teachers and from some students, very positive feedback. And it really depends on the teachers, because if the teachers are enthusiastic, they can get it across to the pupils. And um, maybe that's something which we're also thinking to do, art education for teachers, especially primary school teachers who really are generalists, who are not exposed to, to art. There's a whole new field for us to explore. Any more, any other questions for John? Uh, just here, thank you. John, why didn't the puppy end up in Australia? I'm really sorry that it didn't. We could have. Um, you see, with the projects that we do, we never own the artistic copyright. The artistic copyright rests with the artist, but in fact we paid for the making of it. So we could have in those days bought the puppy for a relatively small sum. But there wasn't enough general interest either from the city, it was in front of the MCA and the MCA had no money. Um, and the Guggenheim in Bilbao wanted to buy it, and they did, and we shipped it to Spain, to Bilbao. Been there ever since and been guarding the Guggenheim. It's a great, great pity that it could have been an icon uh, there forever. Because to maintain it is not that difficult, actually. It's an opportunity lost, unfortunately. Mm. Talking about, say, for example, Puppy and definitely Christo and Wrapped Coast, um, Edmund Capon actually describes in his, in his introduction here that they, especially Wrapped Coast, Christo was a defining moment in, in Australia's art history, and they're certainly iconic, but is there, is there another artist or another work that for you is especially meaningful that maybe may not be quite as, as large scale, I suppose? Well. I think it's obvious 
to talk about the very showy projects like Christo, Jean-Claude, Gilbert and George, um, Jeff Koons, maybe Gregor Schneider on Bondi Beach. But one of the quietest projects, original, was in 74 or 75, uh, Saul Lewitt, who unfortunately died a couple of years ago. But it was Saul Lewitt, really, who coined the term conceptual art and really was the father of conceptual art and minimal art and probably one of the handful most important artists of the second half of the 20th century. But his project was very quiet, very simple, very minimal. But we had the privilege to see it very early on in the mid-70s. And this is something which we also want to do, is to, which we couldn't do then, is to go back to the projects and to write an educational component to the projects and to put them into a historical context so that um, people can say, well, in 1970 that was happening in Australia, that was happening in New York or in London or in Paris. So it's not standalone, it's placed within a historical uh, framework. So throughout all this time, and of course putting on the Carter Art Projects, you also have always been a collector at the same time, and I imagine have some rather good work. So I know that you've donated them to the Art Gallery. My question is, why didn't you give me a call and see if I could look after your works for you? <laughs> I have a spare room. <laughs> I don't think you have a big enough storage. <laughs> Tell me a bit about your motivation for doing that, for, for donating your works to the art gallery, and, and how hard is it to part with these, these works, this collection? Well, there are several questions there. Yeah. Um, I'm good at that, by the way. OK. Um, I started to collect in my early 20s, so it's been very much part of my life. Um, my family, my children, when we first started about donating it, were very generous as I, I, we basically gave away a big part of our assets. But I didn't really want to, maybe from a selfish point of view, break up the collection. And there are many, many works which today the gallery couldn't afford. I couldn't afford, the gallery couldn't afford. But when I bought them 40, 50 years ago, they were 50, 60, 70, 100 dollars. Um, and I think they works which will enhance the gallery's collection. It will alter completely the collection of the, of the gallery. And in a way, something that was private is going to become public, which was my desire with the projects. I never thought about it with the collection, but in fact, it will. So it's rounding the circle in a way. It's certainly a fantastic gift. Um, John Calder, it's been so fantastic to talk to you and, and lovely to meet you. And please thank him for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.